I, again, thank you very much, John, and everyone for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I'm presenting from my luxurious basement in White River Junction, Vermont. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that you know my home here in White River Junction and much of the research that I do in Vermont on bird and insects populations, you know, takes place on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Abenaki people. So I always like to start talking about the mountains by talking about the geographical opposite, you know, salt marshes. You know, sea levels along the New York coast have risen by a foot since 1900, and they're projected to rise along the, the New York state coastline in the tidal Hudson zone region uh, by another foot in the next 30 years and, and maybe by another two feet beyond that um, by the end of this century. So salt marshes share a lot in common with montane um, ecosystems. So salt marshes are this, you know, this narrow linear strip of habitat, right? That's stuck between the mountain, uh, stuck between the ocean on one side and upland habitat on the other. And I did my master's work, cut my ornithological te teeth, so to speak, on uh, salt marsh sparrows at the University of Connecticut studying post-fledging ecology there. And salt marsh sparrows, you know, salt marshes are grasslands, they're grass dominated, and they survive daily flooding events, very small flooding events. And salt marsh sparrows, as you see in this slide here, they build their nests on the ground. And they have all these adaptations for the young and eggs to survive these small flooding events. But large flooding events cause the eggs to float out of the nest and for the young to drown. So, with the, flood, with the sea level rise in New York and, and the projection, um, a bunch of friends and I got together a couple of years ago. Um, we put our mathematical brains together, developed this giant population viability analysis model. Uh, we, we modeled climate change, modeled sea level rise and, and tidal changes and tidal patterns, and took everything we knew about the biology of salt marsh sparrows, how frequently they nest and re-nest, probability of survival, everything put it in this model. And bottom line, we predict salt marsh sparrows will not be able to breed within 40 years. That sea level will be too, sea level rise will be too much, that there won't be a period of time where it's long enough for salt marsh sparrows to fit a clutch in before you get one of these really high tide events that covers these salt marshes you see in these photos here up to your knees and kills everything in the marsh. Um, so 40 years is what we predict for this species. Adults will probably live on for another decade after that, um, being, you know, flying around the landscape, but being unable to successfully have a long enough window of time to complete a clutch. Now, if you think about it, montane ecosystems are facing a lot of those same pressures, right? You have this top of the mountain and you have this, you know, subalpine ecosystem essentially below it. And as climate pushes the envelope for that ecosystem up, Where's it going to go? It, mountain's not getting any taller on any kind of you know decade or century um, uh, time span. So all that happens is that habitat gets squeezed. Now with salt marshes, you may be wondering well, why doesn't as the sea level rise won't salt marshes just move up into the landscape? And the answer is no. On the upslope side of the salt marshes are is is a is like a highway, Boston Post Road or Highway One, and on the other side of that is really expensive real estate homes. And the highway there serves as a tidal break to protect those homes from the water. No one is going to volunteer to move their very expensive home up and back 200 meters into the landscape and move the road. That's not going to happen. And just like at the top of the mountain with montane ecosystems, they're just going to get squeezed and it's going to be less and less until there's basically nothing left. So organisms occurring at high elevations and high latitudes have a lot working against them, honestly, in the face of global climate change. You know, as temperatures warm, you know, these species have reduced capacity, really, to move up slope and poleward, certainly compared to species whose core populations occur at lower elevations and lower latitudes. There's, there's not that much more space for them to go. You know, higher latitudes on average are warming something like twice as fast as the rest of the world, um, and montane ecosystems are warming, um, yeah, twi twice as much. Uh, mountaintops are warming something like five times as much as the rest of the world. We don't fully understand actually why that warming is so rapid at mountaintops. Uh, one of the hypotheses, it's, it's the albedo effect, this idea that as snow cover is reduced um, or shortened during the year, that more soil and rock is exposed and the darker color than the snow, of course, so that 
absorbs more heat, and it's a positive feedback system that warms up the, the mountaintop faster. But bottom line is mountains are warming much faster than we are experiencing down here at, at lower elevations. So, you know, perhaps unsurprisingly, we, we have evidence from literally around the world, South Pacific, Africa, Europe, South America, that montane species from plants to animals to butterflies are responding to global climate change by, by moving upslope, shifting upslope. For those species like, like pica, um, rare species like pica that have decades of good quality long-term monitoring, you know, we see 30 years ago, pica were moving up like a meter per decade. And now they're moving up something like 25 meters per decade. So the rate of upslope movement is increasing, uh, is, is exaggeration, is exaggerating. So um, there was a nature paper recently came out. It showed that 87% of the mountaintops in Europe uh, are being colonized by lower elevation plants that are moving up because the climate is warming there. In the Andes, we see species whose range is over 1,200 meters. That range for those species, their, their species are moving up, the range is shrinking, and the overall population size of those species, unsurprisingly, is getting smaller and smaller, and the populations are becoming more and more fragmented. I could literally give you hundreds of examples um, of the effects of climate change and upslope push for species around the world, um, from fish who move upstream to seek cooler temperatures, um, to birds and plants as well. Uh, globally, you know, the number I, I use is, is something like 11 meters per decade is a pretty good average rate for upslope movement for species. And moving to higher latitudes, um, so poleward, you know, towards the North Pole in the Northern Hemisphere, um, at about 17 kilometers per decade for montane species. Um, and if you think about it, you know, it's diminishing returns, right? And mountains are shaped like a V. And as you move up in elevation, you're getting squeezed against the peak there's simply less and less habitat available and you're just squeezed in with more and more conspecifics and competitors and predators into a smaller and smaller area. So, you know, climate's already changed here in the Northeast United States and it's gonna continue to change at this point, no matter what we do. There's a certain amount of climate change already built in, um, whether we rejoin the Paris Climate Accords uh, or not. You know, ob observed trends in climate, um, over the, you know, the last 120 years, you know, show that our annual temperature here has increased by something like two and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And we've had even greater warming during the winter than that. Precipitation patterns have also changed during that time with a slight trend towards greater annual precipitation um, and definitely a substantial increase in, in precipitation events. So we're getting more precipitation overall, but it's coming in fewer events. And, you know, interestingly, that means that some areas, even though we're overall more rainfall have higher drought stress because there is greater amount of time between individual rainfall events. The projected climate models suggest that we're gonna see an increase in mean annual temperature for our region, you know, something like three to eight degrees Fahrenheit over the next hundred years. That's mean annual temperature. So that's including winter and summer temperatures. It's not that our summers are just going to be eight degrees warmer every day. Um, so that takes me to this slide here. Now, this Fay et al. study really caught my attention. And you know, over a 30-year period, they tracked the mean latitudinal and longitudinal distribution for a bunch of eastern United States tree species. Each dark, um, sorry, each light green dot you see is the geographic center of a tree species distribution 30 years ago. And the blue arrow points the direction the tree species range has shifted and the dark green dot indicates the current distribution. So most of the species, more than half in their study over that 30 year period shifted their ranges westward and northward following changes in precipitation and temperature gradients respectively. Now you're probably wondering like I did when I read this paper, like how do trees move, right? You know, Lord of Rings and Ents set aside for a second. How do tree species move so dramatically and so rapidly across the landscape? Of course, they're immobile in their adult stage, their canopy stage. But what happens is, you know, trees on the southern periphery of the range where it's getting hotter, it's getting drier, they have higher adult mortality, they're able to produce fewer viable seeds, and the seeds they do produce have a lower probability of reaching the sapling stage. Trees on the northern periphery of the range, it's getting more and more favorable 
for that species each year. They have higher adult survival, the trees start to grow faster, they pump out more seeds, et cetera. And that's how the distribution shifts, not by movement of adults, but by recruitment, changes in the recruitment across the landscape. So this data from the Audubon Christmas bird count, you know, documents similar shifts in winter bird ranges. I think this is the, yeah, the, the 20 species with the most movement um, in their winter range and in the center of their distribution from the 1960s to the early 2000s. And, um, you know, these speak, you know, it's a very similar pattern to the trees you saw in the last slide. They're moving northward and they're moving westward following those changes in temperature and precipitation gradients in the United States and North America more in general. Now, in this, in this study, 27% of the species actually shifted a little bit to the south. And I've heard a number of people suggest that, well, that's evidence that climate change isn't really affecting things, you know, like some species are moving to the south and, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a coin flip, right, or something. And first of all, you know, the, most of the species they looked at in the study shifted to the north and west. A quarter of them did shift to the south. But there is not one size fits all strategy to surviving climate change. And, you know, for the first part, first thing I'd say is for a lot of the species, especially conservation concern species, they're rare, they occur in low density, and we have the least statistical ability to say something about how those populations are responding to climate change on the landscape. Um, they're just difficult to say anything, period. But there are lots of reasons why a species, it may be advantageous for a species to move tracking climate and they're unable to. So the first thing that comes to mind is that that species certainly is probably dependent upon climate, but there may be something else like insect emergence in the spring that their breeding is time to co-occur with. And if that insect population isn't shifting as rapidly as the climate is, it may be more advantageous for them to stay put, so to speak, than it is to follow the climate and lose their, lose their important food resource. You might also have physical features of the habitat that are important to you. For birds, I'm thinking things like caves and cliffs and wetlands and even grasslands that don't physically have the ability to just migrate across the landscape and track climate change. So you may be tied to those physical features. Third, um, you know, everyone is trying to move. I was just booking some tickets for this winter break to go home to see my, to see my mom with my family in, in the Midwest. And I quickly realized like, man, everyone is trying to get the same tickets. Nobody wants to fly at six in the morning. Nobody wants to land at midnight. And uh, everyone's trying to find that sweet spot. And there's all this competition for those limited seats on the plane. And it's the same thing with climate change. You know, if your competitors and your predators and the parasites and diseases are all shifting as well, it may be that you can't compete with your competitors or out, out survive the predators by shifting in the environment, they may have a competitive or predatory advantage. It may be better off for you to stay in this not so great climate, but with reduced com competitive processes around you. Um, and lastly, you know, it may be that these populations are declining. This common pattern we see for species when they're declining is you think of like a circle. Species typically decline from the periphery of the ranges and get to smaller and smaller pockets. Um, that's a common pattern we see from corals to plants to vertebrates. And it may be that even though the client, your favorable climate is shifting to the north, if you happen to also be declining, you may be shifting to the south and that very well uh, towards the center of the range and that very well could be to the south. So the fact that some species are shifting to the south does not mean that climate change is, is not impacting bird populations. That's, you know, that's like saying, um, because cigarettes don't give everyone that smokes cancer, thankfully, that cigarettes don't cause cancer. That's an absurd overextension of that argument. So, Coming back to the to montane ecosystems, you know, over the next 300 years, there's a lot of modeling efforts going into projecting future tree distributions for civicultural practices and, and, and maple sh and sugaring productions. And those models predict that we're gonna lose more than half of our spruce fir forest, you know, our, basically our subalpine forest here in the next 300 years. Um, and it's gonna be replaced by the upslope movement of maple and beech forests, which are shown in brown. And you, you're absolutely going to have sugar uh, spruce fir forest over here. It's just the size of the pixels kind of is a little misleading. It, it looks like there's no spruce fir left. We're going to lose about half of it. Those same models, per, you know, as the climate becomes warmer um, and wetter, those, those conifers are going to lose their competitive advantage over deciduous trees at higher elevations. So, you know, um, 
and I say, yes, we're going to lose more than half of that. Um, and, and given these forecasted changes for spruce fir forests, you know, it's entirely reasonable to expect that populations of animals and plants that depend on that spruce fir forest are also going to experience population shrinkage and population declines. I think that's entirely reasonable. So this slide is a mess and it's meant to be a mess. I like very simple slides. This one's this a lot going on here. And I, I know we're talking about birds tonight and I just wanna emphasize that it's easy just to be focusing on like a single species of birds or birds as a group, but birds don't live in a vacuum. Birds eat things, other things eat birds. All of these things are going to be affected by climate change and are going to be changing. Um, a lot of the organisms you, you see here, there are predicted drastic changes for these species in response to global climate change. And we're not even going to begin to talk about, uh, you know, new invasive species that show up that aren't here yet that are going to cause all kinds of un unforeseeable changes to our ecosystem, forest ecosystems. But it's not just birds that are changing. It is birds are, you know, black pole warblers are one puzzle piece in a thousand piece puzzle. And, you know, 990 of those other pieces are also going to be shifting on the landscape. It is, um, it's a big mess, kind of like, just like this slide. <laughs> so, um, you know, you know, again, we've seen something like a, a degree and a half Celsius of climate warming, um, you know, here in the, in the Northeastern United States we're projected to see, you know, up to four and a half degrees. So um, over the next hundred years, and these models you see here some by produced by some of my colleagues and the folks at Audubon and are, it's a great interactive website. I encourage you to check it out, survival by degrees. You know, you can see how these models, these species distribution models predict that these species ranges are gonna change on the landscape in response to a very modest two degrees Celsius increase in temperature. So. Anywhere you see red there for that, you know, the blue-headed vireo, um, canid jay, and, and boreal chickadee, those are areas where they're breeding currently, but under the next hundred years, under the two degrees Celsius increase, those species are projected to be lost from those areas in red. Yellow indicates some probability of sustain, a sustainability, but more likely to be lost from there as well. So species we're gonna lose here, entirely as breeders in New England, about 30 to 40 species. We're talking Canada Jay and Boreal Chickadee, Lincoln Sparrow, Morning Warbler, yellow belly Flycatcher, black pole Warbler, White-Throated Sparrow, Hermit Thrush, Winter Wren, Palm Warblers, um, Crossbills, Grosbeaks, they're gone. Those models predict those species will not be breeders here. You know, we might still have White-Throated Sparrows here in the winter. Um, so those species are gonna shift their ranges northward. And some of those species like black pole, that's okay. It, you know, our, our world is gonna be less interesting because we don't have black poles here in the Northeast United States, but 98% of the black pole warbler population breeds in Canada and their range is globally secure. There's, there's not concern about them. Spruce grouse, on the other hand, um, totally different story, big trouble. Uh, birds like boreal chickadee are expected to have a net decrease in 50%, 50%, of their total breeding range size. So they'll be shifting to the north somewhat, but they'll be losing a lot more of their breeding grounds in the south. And that's a, a huge concern, obviously. It's gonna be an exciting time for birders. I have no doubt about that. You know, we're gonna see great increases, or we're projected to see great increases in species like, you know, Eastern towhee and field, but it's also birds like field, um, you know, field sparrow and cerulean warbler and hooded warbler and yellow-throated vireos and yellow-throated warblers. And it's, it's going to be an exciting time. We're going to lose 30, 40 species and the models predict we're going to gain 30, 40 species. You know, your grandkids will not grow up visiting the same forest that, that you and I do. It's just going to be different. Um, you're not going to walk out one day and suddenly the composition of birds and plants is different. It's going to be gradual and it's going to be, it's going to be slow over time. Um, so, you know, a lot of these results are, are, are pretty similar to those by my friends and colleague, uh, Joel Ralston and Jeremy Kirschman. Um, you know, they used the GIS-based climate niche model and predicted that nearly all of the boreal forest birds in, in, in New England, New York and, and, uh, and New England are gonna be lost due to climate change by the end of the century, um, which is a sobering fact. Now, these species distribution models, and, and I can say this as a statistical modeler, they are really simplistic models. 
they take the assumption that birds are going to move on the landscape to stay in their preferred suite of climatic conditions. We obviously know that bird populations are shaped and driven by lots of things besides climate. The things they eat and the things that eat them and parasites and disease, for example. Honestly, we just lack the ability to include those things in the model. We don't know enough about the relationships between worm-eating warblers and the, the, the dozen insects that are most important to them. We don't know how those insects are going to respond to climate change. We just unfortunately can't develop models that are that sophisticated at the moment to, to encompass that. So we, we fall back and hope that climate is a suitable proxy for how those species are going to respond to climate change. So, um, you know, and that's where I think Mount Birdwatch comes in. What, what we really need a lot is calibration of those models, those species distribution models. How fast can species actually move upslope? How poleward can, how fast can species move poleward? So Mountain Birdwatch is a, a community project that I man, community science project that I manage. And for the last decade, community scientists go out every June, get up at, they, they hike up to high elevation hiking trails in the middle of nowhere. Um, they get up at 3.30 in the morning and start counting birds like 45 minutes before dawn in the dark. Um, and then they do all their counts, they go back and sleep in their tent, you know, for a couple hours. Um, you know, we have 765 long-term sampling stations of those black dots there from the Catskills up to Baxter State Park. And we only monitor 10 bird species plus red squirrel, which is the primary nest predator for these species. Um, we monitor those 10 species intentionally. And, uh, you know, it's a huge task to ask people to be able to confidently identify every chip note of every species. So we focus on these 10 species for, uh, we have some specific hypotheses about these 10 species. But over the last 10 years, those, um, those community, uh, community scientists have conducted more than 25,000 point counts at those 765 long-term sampling stations. And they range from 550 meters, which is like the um, hardwood transition zone, uh, in Maine, all the way up to 1,500 meters. So, and again, almost all these locations are in the spruce fir forest. Um, a lot of studies, and this is a viable approach, you know, they, there's some, somebody banded birds on some mountaintop 30 years ago, and they go back, you know, this year, and they ban the birds using the same protocol, and they compare two individual years, and to see if the birds have shifted up slope, or are they decreased in abundance, and I, I think that's a valuable approach, and I'm not being overly critical of that. But in this analysis you're about to see, I took 10 consecutive years of mountain bird watch data and incorporated them all into a single analysis. This has the benefit that it really reduces the chance that one weird year or a poorly sampled year at the beginning or the end of the study overly affects and, and drives the results. It greatly improves our ability to, to model the relationships between abundance and elevation and abundance and latitude because I can borrow strength across years in the model. Um, I am a quantitative ecologist. I am happy to geek out talking models, but I will only do so if asked intentionally to do so, um, as my wife constantly reminds me. Um, so I'll just say briefly that I, in a Bayesian framework, I developed some end mixture models and I should say the, the community scientists do repeated point counts at each one of these locations. And that's immensely valuable over just a simple like one, one three minute count or something like that. Um, because then I can actually estimate the birds that they missed. And I can look at differences and account statistically for differences in observers and the, in the time of the morning they do the count, even background noise, which the, the, record, the observers record. I can statistically account for that to see what birds they likely were there but likely missed. Um, in these models, I allow for interactions between year and latitude because it's likely that birds aren't moving, you know, upslope, um, you, you, you know, in the same, at the same rate as they are in the Catskills compared to the Katahdin. So, you know, I think it's actually, I think it's really difficult to come up with a good way to measure elevation and latitude shifts, you know, especially when you're measuring these shifts in just a, a segment of the population. You know, Bicknell Thrush, we're lucky that, you know, the Mountain Birdwatch study area basically covers the entire American breeding population range. But for those other species, of course, they occur to the north and somewhat to the south. And um, so that creates some real challenges. I think this, fig this hypoth um, hypothetical figure here kind of points at some of those challenges. But 
Um, my approach definitely has its drawbacks. Every statistical approach does. But basically, I wrote this custom function. And using you know, 27,000 point counts, five-minute point counts of the last 10 years, I basically asked the model. Uh, and I should point out, these models take days to run for individual species. It's heavily computer intensive. Um, I basically asked the model, say, hey, what's the, what's the middle, you know, what's the mean elevation? If you estimated where every, you know, black pole warbler was in our study area, um, what's the mean elevation? So what elevation does 50% of the black pole warblers occur above and that same elevation where 50% occur below? Um, we could extend this analysis to look at the very highest elevation black poles or the very bottom uh, elevation black poles, but and I did have done that, but today for simplicity, I'm, I'm just focusing on the middle elevation you know, threshold. So then I can compare those estimates, that 50% threshold across years to see if the population as a whole, right, has shifted upslope or downslope, right? We don't want to measure just the highest elevation that some individual black pole warbler has been detected at. That's one bird. Is that indicative of the entire population? Hard to say. So I measure the middle, the, the, the biggest part of the mass of the whole population. And the same thing for latitude. And I'm, you know, really, as a modeler, I'm really happy to point out that all of these estimates have uncertainty. You know, none of these things estimate um, parameters perfectly. And the, my modeling approach always brings in all that uncertainty into my estimates, and I keep it. I don't ignore it. I don't throw it away. So for the estimates you're going to see, it includes all the uncertainty around the estimates as well. So um, I'm going to jump right into it here. So, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to show you through one species. If I showed you all uh, 10 species, I think it'd be a bit mind numbing. It is for me at least. So one species, we have yellow belly flycatcher on the y-axis and it's basically density here. Um, it's their abundance entirely within our study area. The year's on the x-axis here. Yellow belly flycatcher, as you can see, has declined by 22% across the entire study area that we, that we focus on. Those declines are not uniform. In Maine, the declines are something like 11% per year. In the Catskills over the last decade, uh, sorry, 11% total over the decade, not per year. Um, in the Catskills, we've seen a 75% total population decline in yellow belly flycatchers over the last decade. That's staggering. Um, so here you see that relationship uh, between abundance and time. The dark color line is the, is the mean estimate. These lighter colored lines, they're just mm, slightly less probable alternative estimates of that dark line, okay? So um, here you see the relationship between the predicted abundance on the y-axis for yellow belly flycatchers and elevation on the x, all right? And it's, it's, and it's um, remember that it's, it's also simultaneously varying with latitude. It's, it's, it's confusing. So the green lines are for our Baxter State Park, Katahdin which is 46 degree latitude. And the purple line shows the elevational relationship with abundance for yellow-bellied flycatchers and Catskills. Each line shows the relationship for a single year. And each one of these lines has their own, you know, 95% uh, credible interval arounding it, showing the uncertainty, but they all overlap. And so I'm not showing you that just because we wouldn't be able to make out anything um, in this figure. So let's, let's look at how this relationship has changed over the course of a decade. Okay, 2011, 2012. Wow, I mean, you can see the predicted abundance, you know, for the, for, at elevation for Catskills has declined across all elevations. That matches our observed approximately 75% decline for yellow belly flycatchers um, in the Catskills. Um, it you know, basically says no matter what elevation you occupy, it's, the Catskills are a, a tough place to eke out a living for yellow belly. At higher, elevate, at higher latitudes around the Baxter State Park, um, you're seeing that yellow belly flycatcher density is increasing at higher elevations and decreasing at the lower elevations there. So um, it's decreasing all, all, all elevations in the Catskills, but increasing only at higher elevations around Katahdin, basically. So let's look at that relationship also between abundance and latitude. And again, this is for yellow-bellied flycatcher. Each line is a single year. I just arbitrarily chose 
um, 800 meters and 1200 meters to give you two different examples. Um, I should also point out that, oh, I like this last slide, sorry. The Catskill lines, there, there, there really isn't spruce fir forest below 1050 meters. That's why this line stops here. And, and similarly, there isn't really spruce fir forest, um, you know, at 800 meters below 43 uh, degrees latitude. So that's why the line, the lines are different. So again, each year is a, is a uh, each line is a different year. And let's scroll through that relationship between abundance of yellow-bellied flycatchers and their latitude. I think you can see where this pattern is going, right? I mean, quite similar to elevation, you know, predicted abundance decline throughout the entire study area um, um, at relatively low elevations and increased only at high elevations, only at higher latitudes. So putting everything together, and most importantly, considering the actual you know, elevation latitudes that yellow belly flycatchers in the Northeast occur at, you know, I estimated that yellow belly flycatchers in our study population have shifted up slope by about 27 meters. That's the mean estimate. This vertical bar is the 95% Bayesian credible, credible interval. It's just, a, it's just a measure of uncertainty. So and yellow belly, this is a big line. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty. Yellow belly flycatcher is not a, a common bird. It doesn't occur in high density. Um, it's one of the species we have the least statistical power to comment on because they're relatively rare in our data set. So again, they've shifted up slope by about 27 meters and they've shifted poleward by about seven kilometers over the last decade. So looking at, at all the species here, this is the total elevational shift over the last 10 years for all of these species. This is nine species. I excluded fox sparrow from this analysis because we only detect, um, you know, like, like 30 or 40 fox sparrows in a given year. And there's, these models are so complicated. Uh, there's no way they, there's no way we could run them. I could run the model with such sparse data, unfortunately. Um, so fox sparrow is excluded. So for these other species, you're seeing upslope shifts in species like black capped chickadee. Hermit thrush, white-throated sparrow, yellow-bellied flycatcher, and black pole, and and and, and downslope shifts for species like boreal chickadee and big male thrush. Um, I should also point out, you know, as a, as a statistician, it's it's tempting to like look at one of these credible intervals and go, oh well, it overlaps zero, so it's non-significant. Um, as a Bayesian person, I don't I don't think of things like that. You know, I think of it like playing the lottery here. 99% of the posterior evidence suggests that white-throated sparrows are moving upslope. 1% of the evidence from our model suggests they're moving downslope. As a betting person, I'm betting they're moving upslope. Um, and the same thing for Bicknell thrush, I'm betting they're moving downslope because the cumulative weight of the evidence is suggesting that, the ratio of upslope to downslope movement. So for latitude shifts, you're seeing that species like black-capped chickadee, hermit thrush, um, black pole warbler appear to be shifting southward. Um, I think that takes a bit of interpretation and is a bit is a bit difficult to wrap your mind around. You know, black capped chickadees, I would stress, breed much further to the south than than the Catskills do. So an increase in the southern part of their range doesn't necessarily mean that birds are moving from the north to the south. It could very well mean that birds south of our study area are actually moving northward into our breeding, into our study area. Um, you know, I mentioned that all these all these ways to quantify upslope movements have their drawbacks, and and when, because our study area doesn't include the entire breeding distribution of black-capped chickadees, um, and then there are some challenges to interpreting these data. Um, but if we compare these relationships here, I think. Because elevation and latitude are varying at the same time, we have to look at the results of all this put together. So this figure here shows you the annual trend of these, of these bird populations on the Y and the total elevational shift over the last decade on the X. I've excluded black-capped chickadees from this analysis because black-capped chickadees are doing something phenomenal that none of these other species are. Over the last 10 years in our study area, black-capped chickadees have tripled in their abundance in our study area, like a 12% increase per year, which isn't, I mean, it's incredible. Um, that's phenomenal and that, that is not anything near what these other bird species um, are doing. 
So um, if you ignore black cap chickadee for a second, and that's where the point would occur if it was included, you can you definitely see that species who are declining more rapidly are those species who are moving upslope more rapidly. To me, this suggests that those are likely the species that are most sensitive to climate change. And as the climate warms, they have but one option or their best option is to try to track the climate. And unfortunately, all they can do is move upslope. So the species that are declining the fastest are those species that are moving upslope the fastest. Again, I think that suggests that they're the most sensitive species to climate change. Here we have annual trend. Again, black capped uh, chickadees excluded from this analysis. You can see just how bizarre black capped chickadees are. You know, 10 years ago, we, we banned every week on Mount Mansfield. 10 years ago, we didn't capture, capture black capped chickadees on Mount Mansfield. And now we capture them every single week. Um, it's the highest mountain in Vermont. We have other species like American Robin and, and Blue Jays that are now our common breeders on top of Mount Mansfield that we encounter every week banding up there. Um, so here you see, and taking these results together, um, that those species whose trends are approaching positive territory are also more likely to shift to the north. So putting those two figures together suggests to me that spruce fir, spruce for, uh, spruce fir forest birds who are faring better are the ones that are moving northward and downward at the same time. Um, that is indicative of a species who is able to track their preferred climate. Remember, as you move north, it gets cooler, right? So moving northward and down in elevation is suggestive of species who are trying to maintain this climatic envelope that they're occurring in. And those are the species who are doing best. The species who are not faring well are those who are rapidly racing to the top of the mountain and or whose populations are contracting uh, back uh, southward. And remember in our study area, you know, you have Mount Washington, which is the highest mountain. For those species that are just slightly north of there, um, and, that's where the, and that's where boreal birds are most dense in the Northeast United States between the Whites and Katahdin, for those species to move up in elevation, for many of those species, for many of those individuals means moving south to move up slope Mount Washington. So, um, so what I'm gonna say, you know, what does the future hold for 2100, you know, in the next 100 years uh, or so? A projected 3 billion more people on the planet and a whole lot of change in every component of the ecosystem and not just birds. Birds are going to change. The thing, the distribution of birds are going to change. The abundance and distribution and relative density of the things they eat and the things that eat them are also going to be simultaneously changing. It's critical. And I think, I think you can tell from these slides, like there's no way you got to manage each one of these species individually, like we can for like bald eagle or uh, peregrine falcons or wild turkeys. We, we don't have the capacity to intensely manage um, all of these species like that. We're going to have to take a 10,000 foot view and think about landscape management um, more so than ever. We have to preserve corridors of habitat to allow the species that are here now to be able to move northward and move upslope in elevation. And when those species are gone, those corridors of habitat, whether it's grassland corridors or forested corridors, early successional forest corridors, um, those corridors of habitat will be the means that species from the south move into our northeastern landscape to colonize, um, to colonize our, our region. It's, it's critical we think of it from that 10,000 foot point of view. Um, and lastly, I'll just say, you know, like the Christmas bird counts, they're going to be, you know, the 27% of species that moved south in the CBC data. You know, there's going to be a lot of surprises as we look at more and more species. And that's great, you know, and as we do so, we're going to be, the more and more species we look at, the better position we're going to be in to look for commonalities across species and re the response to climate change. Those are commonalities based on diet preferences and natural history and breeding preferences, um, you know, presence you know, commonalities and other life history traits. And all of that understanding, along with documenting the rates at which species are capable of moving upslope and poleward, are going to put us in a much stronger position to be able to manage and conserve montane bird populations moving forward. Um, and with that, I am I'm happy to expand upon any of that and take any questions and and uh, and thank you very much and.